All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Commissioner's Courts. Nine o'clock, we'll get started. Today is the eighth day of March, 2021. Let's begin with an invocation and a pledge of allegiance, if you'll stand with me. Lord, thank you for this day, Lord. I, I pray that you will be with us as we uh, make decisions for our county and uh, give us wisdom and guidance today. Be with all the workers and first responders in our county, Lord, and be with our nation and our county as we uh, recover and uh, recoup from this coronavirus, Lord, and uh, bless each and every one that's here today. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number one, public comments time. Anyone here that would like to address the court on a non-agenda item? And of course, you may address the court as we get to each individual uh, item, if you would like. Anyone want to take advantage of this time? Then we'll move to item number two, three, and four. We've got three sets of minutes here. We've got a regular meeting from the eighth day of February, and we got disrupted and delayed with several days off there that caused our meetings not to be ready at our last meeting. We want to take care of that one. And then we have the last uh, meeting on February 20. 5th and then we had excuse me on February 22nd then we had an emergency meeting on the 25th but uh, let's take those one at a time item number two there are the meetings from February 8th that was our first regular meeting of the month of February motion we approve motion to approve that set of minutes is made by Commissioner Parker and a second by Second. Commissioner Fitch, all in favor of approval of that set of minutes, say aye. Aye. We'll move on to the last meeting of the month of February, last regular meeting that was two weeks later than the uh, February 8th meeting. Make a motion to approve them. Motion to approve, made by Commissioner Fitch. Second. Second by Commissioner Parchman. All in favor, say aye. 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 And then lastly, we had an emergency meeting there, a brief one on February the 25th. Make a motion to approve it. And the motion to approve that set of minutes is made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second by Commissioner Fitch. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Yeah. Item number five is our report from commissioners regarding road work. Let's start uh, on this end. Precinct four, Commissioner Parker. Uh, we've just been patching and, and uh, trying to get the road back, back up from the ice and snow. Uh, we're still on it today. Okay. We had, had a culvert with it floated on us uh, last week, and we ended up, I mean, it had to get it back in, but... Uh, that was other than patching those those two things about all we've been able to do. What happens in a, in a ice storm or a snowstorm? What's the most typical damage that you're seeing? I've had some places, and I know John. I think maybe Jeff has too. I don't know what for sure what Dana's had, but had water just down under that road, and it it uh, freezes, and when it does, it just buckles the road up, and it just I mean it just breaks it all to pieces. You have to go in there and rip it out and put something in there to dry it out. And, and, uh, all, so. Okay. All right. Commissioner Applewhite. Well, we'd like to say, Jimmy, like Jimmy said, we're uh, just ordering uh, stuff to do potholes and stuff, trying to catch up with the, the situation on the roads, fixing culverts and stuff. Commissioner Fitch. Um, uh, we had some big time ice damage on 1030 where the road buckled up in two places we worked on that quite a bit had to close the road for several days and we got it going again and we'll be working on that for a while we have a couple trees that give us trouble we're cleaning finishing up cleaning one of them up today and a lot of patching all over the precinct and uh, put one culvert in on 2415 so busy trying to get these roads going again and the weather's cooperating which is good now 
Is that the road that Dr. Davis lives off of? I think I heard his wife, Cindy, talking about that yesterday. Yes, that's yes. 1030? Yes, yeah. yes. So uh, my preacher's road is the main road there, so I'm trying to get that up just because my preacher lives on it. I don't want to have to walk the aisle there Sunday. How, so. did, how did they get, how'd they get yeah. around that? So they come in from uh, 1734. So then uh, this, it was in, that, my, that road cuts from 67 to 1734. It's two miles long. And the first half mile on that south end is where this bad soft spot is. And so we shut down the first half mile of that road, uh, three quarters of a mile, and they can all come in the back way, which is pretty inconvenient. And a lot of people cut from, through that come road. Come in from the north, from 1734? Come in from 1734 and go uh, back the back way. Most all the traffic goes up that south end of that 7, uh, 1030. The first mile of it has several housing divisions, a couple roads to the right they turn on. And uh, me and Jeff share that area, so I do a, a mile of it, he does a mile of it, and we work together all the time. And uh, the right side of the road is Precinct 1, the left side of the road is Precinct 2. And it's on our uh, road list this summer to, on the uh, road grant to chip seal it is the final process there so we're both out there working uh repaving and fixing soft spots and this summer is going to be a big big dramatic change out there will be nice when we get done thank you precinct one commissioner parchment we passed a lot of potholes uh we scanned county road 1695 we passed the bridges on 1905 where you're entering and exiting them where they're not so rough uh, replaced all the culverts on County Road 1046, and we are now overlaying the north end of County Road 1030 and uh, getting it ready for chips. All right, very good. Thank you. Hey, James, would you do me a favor while I'm going to go ahead and start on the fire contract? But I did leave my phone in the office, and I'll use that to call Seth Bryan with K Bro when we get to his. So. Let's jump over item number six, and Seth Bryan got busy on a project and is not going to be here in person. Uh, he thought he was, even though I had put, put it on the agenda for him to appear by phone. We're now back to him appearing by phone, so we will get him on the telephone. I told him it would be after 9.15. But while we've got several of our uh, fire uh, department personnel here, we'll go ahead and move on to item number seven consider and possibly approve a volunteer fire department contract we started this process i guess a couple of meetings ago and uh, after that first meeting we decide to form a committee and that committee consisted of a couple of commissioner well a commissioner and barbara and myself and three of our chiefs we met together to go through this made several changes and i believe i got all the changes made that we had agreed upon. Uh, in my opinion, we've got a document that's workable. It, uh, it, it applies a bit of pressure to our volunteer fire departments to get their uh, documentation filed promptly, uh, specifically uh, run reports and training reports that enables Barbara to uh, calculate how much is owed to them for these runs. And just having good timely information helps everybody. It helps Chief McRae, it helps the individual departments, it helps the county. But we felt like that having a contract, uh, in, instead of just paying out monies to the volunteer fire departments, it was good to document what the expectations were. Is it a perfect document? Maybe not, maybe it will need to be uh, tweaked in the years ahead, but uh, I believe that with the support of our fire chiefs on that document, it's for now, it is a good document. I have not been contacted by any of the fire chiefs that had any specific comments against this document. Uh, Chief McRae, Chief Clark, anybody want to say anything about this? I don't want to uh, be too brief here, but if anybody would like to offer up comment on that, we'll bring you a, a microphone or you can come up to the podium or you don't need to say anything.
Uh, we've only had one concern since all the meetings, and I think it's more concern than anything else. On the front page, uh, under item number one, it does state that we will turn in a training uh, sheet each month, and the training sheet must be sent in to receive your monthly benefits. Uh, during the talks we had in the last committee meeting, uh, we mentioned that there are going to be times when it's not possible to have a training. Now in, on Exhibit A, it says we will have one drill per month of two hours for training. Uh, if you take the one drill times the two hours, that's 24 hours a year. Uh, by state, we're only required to have 20 hours of training per year. Uh, my, my department, take for an example, we don't train during the month of December because of Christmas holiday. We like to give them time to be with their families. Uh, sometimes the first meeting of, of the month in December, we will do a little training, but it's mainly to give them the, most departments have a business meeting the first meeting of the month and then a training the last meeting of the month. So I think what we discussed was if you don't have training that month, still turn in a training sheet, but on the training sheet, explain why you did not train to enable you to get the money for that month. Is that what we all agreed to, pretty much? That sounds perfectly reasonable to me. You're right, there's not going to necessarily and be training. Each because month. we agreed to that, I don't see any reason to have to change anything in the document. It's just, it says you will turn in a training sheet. Well, if you don't train, you turn in a training sheet as to why. If it becomes to where you all see that we have one department that's not training like they should be, it'll be evident in reviewing the training reports and you can do something at that point in time. But I think the document as it stands is still a good document. There's just that one concern. Do you want to reword anything if that's necessary? I don't think we do. I, it's. It says in here you'll turn in, in a training sheet. sheet. If you didn't have training, but you can at least document that for whatever reason we didn't have it this month, and that way nobody comes up later and says, oh, well, yeah, we had training back back then, I just didn't turn in a sheet. You no, know, you did turn in a sheet. It says, in fact, you didn't have any training that month. And again, not that that's a bad thing because you will turn in sheets. The, the contract says you will turn in a training sheet each month. Mm -hmm. If you don't trade, still turn it in and explain why you didn't trade. And I would think that would be good with all parties. 20 is still the guideline anyway, so that'd be, that'd a whole, we'll have to write 20 hours yearly or be good with that because y'all have to do 20 anyway. So is that, is that, that's all we need is the 20. Is that one, one, two, what you got 30 days to turn it in or? Yeah, we, we all turn in our training sheet along with our run sheets and everything at the right. same time. So, well, Like I said, like, I know a couple weeks that snow, uh, we didn't get to, uh, nobody was meeting, so they didn't get to turn their sheets in. She was concerned, but if you give them, you know, instead of 30 days, 45 days. But I don't know. I, I think 30 is more than generous because okay. when I sit down to do my reports right. at the end of the month, it takes me at the most 30 minutes. Uh, the longest it takes me is to scan the reports so I can send them to Barbara because we do it by computer now. But the, I, I don't see any reason why you can't have your reports in within 30 days. Well, like I said, it was that snow was just once in a uh, time that, that nobody was, we didn't have a meeting that week here too. To see everybody to sign their run sheets and stuff. But the same with uh, this last month. Yeah. We had that uh, one week that I was snowed in, couldn't even get out of my lane. Right. But we were still able to get the reports in on time, and I think I, I missed it by three days, and I've sent them in on the third. But it's, again, it, it shouldn't be any reason. Well, I don't know if you remember back in 2015, we tried to, to do this contract, and we set it up for 15 days, and everybody agreed to it. So I, I think 30 is more than enough. I don't know if there's a mishap that you could be, you know, a legitimate uh, question. I should be able to uh, say, okay, we'll, we'll extend it a little bit or whatever. 
things do happen. As long as everybody agrees on it. Yeah, we have, we haven't had any discussion amongst the chiefs or the committee as 30 days being a, a bad number. So, okay. The only other concern was this: this is a contract for all departments, correct? We have not addressed the Talco situation uh, for the time being. I'm, that's another thing that I was going to mention. Right now, Talco uh, operates under different terms. We do need to sit down with them, and I have not heard back from uh, the chief there about having a time to get together. I need to follow back up on that. So that, that was our only concern, that we're all treated the same, that uh, we all get the same pay, that you know, there's, and we had a problem back in 2015 because one department decided they were wanted to be different, and what it does is causes hard feelings amongst the other departments. You know, why why should we abide to this when one doesn't? So, we're all in this together. So I just thought, if you're going to do a contract, do it for everybody. And, and commissioners. You may or may not know it, there is a slight pay discrepancy for the Talco department that does need to be addressed. I didn't want to, you know, we could include everyone, including Talco today, but unless we've had a chance to actually talk uh, to Chief Carroll, I would like to do that one separately, or we can hold off on approving this until we have talked to Chief Carroll. But, uh, I'm not encouraging you to have a different contract for them. I just think in light of the fact that, that it, right now there is a different pay schedule for them, that it would be appropriate to discuss it separately with them. But uh, again, that's your decision. I think we should wait until we get everybody involved, get it on board all at one time. Okay, rather than approving this contract for you, so you'd like to wait and approve it for everyone together. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. Anyone else have a comment? Commissioners, anybody, any of you have any questions, concerns, comments about this fire contract? No. Okay. You've heard Commissioner Applewhite's request. It sounds like he would like to table this. I am. Uh, I will follow whatever directive you give me, or whoever makes a motion. Just make a motion to table it for now till we talk to uh, Talco and see what we need to do from there, just in case. Okay, there's a motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right. The motion is to table this until we have had a chance to uh, talk specifically about how this contract uh, differs slightly from the current pay schedule with Talco, and once we have something worked out with them, then we'll bring this contract back and approve it for all departments. All right. All in favor, say aye of aye. tabling. Aye. aye. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can get Seth on the telephone. Thanks, gentlemen. We appreciate you coming and, and your help doing this uh, contract. speaker yet. I'm getting ready to put you on speaker and on the mic so that all of the commissioners can hear you. So give me one second. Okay, Seth, give me a sound check to make sure we can all hear. Testing, testing. 
Y'all good with that? Yes. yes. All right. Seth, we've got an agenda item here to consider and possibly approve the purchase of additional security software uh, that is being uh, marketed by net data. There's a one-time cost of $3,785 and an annual maintenance cost of $700. So if you can kind of tell us, is, is this optional? Is it mandatory? Do we have other alternatives? What should we do here, Seth? Sure thing. So essentially what this is, is a uh, service that will allow archiving of logs whenever um, an end user logs into net data or signs out of net data. So for example, if somebody, let's say James in your office, if he was logging into net data, this essentially logs that um, so we can go back and view if there were any um, invalid login attempts or successful login attempts on any users throughout the county. This is being done right now because we have to meet uh, CGIS requirements for the sheriff's office, but it is eating up storage on your existing server. So essentially what this service is for is to utilize some other storage um, in the county annex that we can actually store these logs on so you can free up space on your actual net data server. Um, unfortunately, because it's, it's CGIS required, it's not really optional. Um, it's and we shopped around a bit for other services, but this is pretty much the only the only solution. So, uh, for thirty seven hundred and eighty five dollars, do we get any hardware from Net Data? Uh, not no, not that I'm aware of. It's essentially this is just a service. We are providing the hardware that you guys already have. We had some storage that that the county could utilize, so that's what we're doing. And you said we're already doing this. If we're doing it, why are we not already paying for it? So essentially what you're doing right now is you're just storing it on your net data server that you already have, but it's they're having to clear out the logs pretty often just because it, it takes up so much storage. What this allows is to store it on another server that, that you won't have to clear out the logs on so often. I think, I think every two years is how often we'll have to clear them out. Is there any way to accomplish this without going through net data and paying this cost? Um, not to my knowledge, no, sir. Since it's it's essentially their server that they maintain, they have to set up the service to to allow those logs to be stored on another piece of hardware. And you're going to get one of our uh, current or former uh, PCs that has a large hard drive on it or something to accomplish this? Yeah, basically we have a storage server that's already on site that's uh, storing for some file shares and such, and it has plenty of storage to handle this. Uh, so we're just going to utilize a partition of that to store these on. Will this? Will these logs be maintained forever and ever, or will they drop off when they're three months old, six months, a year? How, how does that work? Uh, I believe it's every two years is what we have calculated right now. So after two years, the logs will fall off. Okay. Commissioners, any questions for Seth about this? Sounds like it's necessary. It sounds like there's a purpose for it, and that is security to review any uh, improper logins or potential breaches to our net data service. And we're going to use current existing county owned hardware. We've got to pay net data for their service in the form of a software and then an annual maintenance cost going forward of $700. All right. Okay, if you're in favor of this, let us know. If you're not, let me know. Make a motion to approve it. Motion to approve this purchase of additional security software along with a maintenance cost, $3,785 up front, $700 annually. That motion to approve is made by Commissioner Fitch. Second. Second Commissioner Parker, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, all right, thank you. Thank you, Seth. Let's get back to work. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, back, uh, back on track. Item number eight, consider and possibly approve an annual contract with Newman Electronics for the maintenance of our cameras and the digital recording equipment at a cost of $6,500 annually. We do this each year about this time, and this pays Newman Electronics and Dennis and his staff to 
Uh, let me tell you what the different things are that are covered here, but it's essentially the same service we've been paying for for several years. There has been a $300 increase over last year, but there has been additional cameras since that time as well. So this is a March 1 to March 1 contract. Either party can terminate at any time for no reason, giving 30 days notice. Uh, these are the duties Newman Electronics will perform on a monthly basis. This is, these are monthly and some others are six months. Examine the six digital video recorders and the associated cameras at the courthouse, annex, justice center, Ratliff building, and adult probation. Check for correct recording of each DVR that that, and that the network connections are correct. Ensure that each camera is operational, aimed, and properly focused. Repair any minor fault or problem found with a camera or DVR during that service. In the event a severe problem is found, such as a camera found dead or serious problem with the operation of the recorder or amplifiers, the problem will be reported to Paul Lindsay and an estimate given at that time to repair. These duties will be performed once every six months in conjunction with the monthly service visits. Clean the DVRs, the fans, vents, and filters. Check wiring connections, clean camera lenses, inspect camera housing. Uh, for insect nests, spider webs, remove, clean, and clean the housing lens. The total cost, $6,500 a year. If the contract is terminated prior to year end, the contract amount shall be prorated for the remaining months and the balance refunded. In other words, this is paid up front. This is not a monthly payment, but he's saying if we terminate or he terminates, he'll prorate us back whatever is not used. Also, as part of this, Newman Electronics will always keep a log of services performed and turns this in to Paul Lindsay at the end of each calendar year or if requested uh, by Paul Lindsay during the service period. Questions, comments? Make a motion we approve it. Motion to approve this uh, contract with Newman Electronics made by Commissioner Parker. Second. Second by Commissioner Parchman. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, I will execute this. Item number nine. We've got, um, we'll talk about this in general, and then we're going to hear, but maybe not until 1030, we've got Glenn Calvert, who was one of the two uh, experts that we had come and take a look at the damage. But we can go ahead and start this discussion uh, since we've got our two JPs here. We had, again, as a whole, the county fared very well. Unfortunately, that's not the opinion of our JPs because they got hit pretty hard as a result of our storm. We had frozen pipes in the ceiling space there above Steve's office, and that pipe burst during the extreme cold. And as best we can tell, Steve, that water ran in your office about 17 hours. Is that right? And you came along, it started about 5 p.m. on that, what, Monday or Tuesday? It was, I believe it was a Tuesday at 5, 5, 25, 5, when the camera started to the water coming out. Yeah, and then you showed up the next morning. And Wednesday at 10.30, it came in to uh, the pressure water, and it was two inches deep in the water. So we've got we've got so many things going on here. This is this is uh, you might think a water leak was not that big of a deal, but there's been a dramatic impact over there. And primarily, uh, we got the leak fixed fairly quickly. That's just where the problems began. The water uh, ruined the carpet in the justice center. The carpet was quickly removed by who gets credit for all the muscle there. David Holmes, David came, helped us. 
husbands, wives, some children, everybody jumped in. Your staff. My, my, my staff, your staff, and we quickly, as long as at the constable, everybody pitched in and we got the water out as soon as we could. And then y'all came back the next day or so and cleaned even more. Yes. Uh, so, came back the next day and double spread. deal. Could I, could I maybe get you to either, you, you can sit where you are, maybe grab a mic, and that'll, that'll help us as, as we're discussing this. You're welcome to stand up. You, you can sit down. So we had, we had quite a few, uh, let's just start at the top and go down. We got Dion's Plumbing gets a kudos for coming quickly and fixing the pipes. We had damaged ceiling tiles that needed to be replaced. Uh, the carpet got pulled out, furniture moved, uh, supplies were relocated or thrown away. What else am I missing? Tell us what else was the magnitude Electrical. of that. The natural, uh, one of the first things that did, fortunately, the, I had rubber boots on whether there was electricity in the ground or not. But we had uh, several of our power strips actually burnt uh, or shorted out. Underwater. Had no computers that were sitting on the ground. Unfortunately, they were on the stands and just high enough to keep the water from going into them. Uh, those few uh, furniture items that were destroyed, damaged, beyond the prairie forest, water soakage. Uh, we got the city tiles replaced. There ended up actually being three pipes that had burst, three places in the same line that had bursted and throughout the building. Uh, the major one was in my office. We cleaned all that up. Uh, I've been in contact with International, who is the mitigating crew. Well, the first call you made was to tack our insurance yes. carrier, and that was. And, and, and who's that fellow that you've been dealing Brett with? Brett Anderson. Brett Anderson. Tack. Okay. And uh, he's been real helpful. He told us what what we needed to do to begin with, and that was to get the mediation crew out. It's international, but they're the same type of bunch that was a surf pro and the people that come in and clean water damaged stuff. Steve, you may need to come up to the podium. That, yeah. thing, that speaker may be, well, maybe not. It may have been picking up feedback. So International is the name of a mold remediation or just a remediation that, company? That were able to get back to us first. Okay. And uh, actually, the, they were, Brett gave me the phone number directly to them, uh, and, and a lady named Kim there got everything started. The process was that they, to needed to come down and do an assessment on the building and what not had to be done uh, as far as water damage. The guy came in and they did mold and asbestos tests. The best that I can tell, can help me out, the best I can tell is that the results came down. Or? Well, I'm not sure. Well, just Is it not loud enough or too loud? No, it's, it's a yes. Oh. Yeah. It's my squeaky voice. No, it's not that. It, it, it does. There's some kind of feedback, and it happens from time to time. Anyway, uh, what was that? Uh, Kim, the international, sent the folks down to the, the adjusters, or the, the mediation crew, to do the environmental impact and all that. And they came back and said that basically, I'm just going to say 90% of the interior of the building, a minimum of two feet of 
sheetrock is going to have to be removed to mitigate any wetness. Could possibly even go higher, but the minimum amounts to So feet. the water wicks up into that fiberglass batting that's in the walls, yes. and fortunately, you got the water out quickly. That's the good news. Um, but now we've got wet insulation in there and mold they found already starting to grow. And so Correct. the recommendation Correct. is to cut out two feet of uh, sheet a, rock. A minimum of two a feet. A minute, remove the, uh, the mold. The mold, any mold. Remove um, the insulation, I guess. The way I understand that crew that will do that, they will come in and we'll basically need to be out of the building before they come in and start because it's uh, maybe considered like a hazmat area. They're going to have to put uh, positive pressure fans in. They're going to have to wear their hazmat uh, gear just to remove all this stuff due to the mold spores themselves. They have to go through the state of Texas to get a permit to do that and it's my understanding is it's just for a certain amount of time that they can get this done. I've asked them to hold off on coming and starting anything until we can get locations to, to be housed for the time being for that. Once they come in, the way it's been explained to me, and way I've read this contract with the International, insurance is going to pay for what has been damaged and whatnot. But International gives us the option of whether they put it back together, you know, replace the sheetrock that they've taken out and go with that. But if there's other issues, you know, we have the option of doing it ourselves. Now, and I know you've, I've asked you this, and we may not know a for sure answer, but do we have to have the remediation company do the sheetrock removal and the asbestos, I mean, and, and the insulation treatment? The removal of any, the removal of any... Thing. As opposed to a local contractor that's not a remediation my, my specialist. My understanding is they have to be licensed by the state to be to remove remove these mold products or anything that's wet. That's my understanding. That's what I get from everybody that I that I've talked to on the phone. Uh, because it, they have to have to be licensed by the state for hazmat work to remove the the mold. Fortunately, there was no asbestos found at the time during the testing in, in the sheetrock itself or the, what, where they took their samples, but there are more mold spores, and of course you can visibly see mold spores, and this is throughout 90% of the building. Where does the remediation company's work stop? Do they do, they do the actual cut into the sheetrock and the removal of the my asbestos. understanding, sir, is yes, sir. They they come in and they remove all that and they bag it up into hazmat bags and then dispose of it in a proper disposal area. And that's potentially where their work starts. They leave a hole in our wall and they leave a gap in the insulation. Yes, sir. Um, we've got lots of built-in built cabinets up against the wall. That's going to have to, they'll they'll be tearing those out too to get to those areas as well. Uh, so, you know, if we've got a wall length uh, bookcases that's up against the sheetrock as it is now, that's going to have to be removed so they can get to it all. And I, didn't, be I didn't know that. Uh, the, like for instance, in, in my office, the uh, big wall cabinet's got eight doors on it for files and whatnot to go in there. That was soaked really well. Everything in there was wet, even the wood and everything, but just to get to the back side of it. Now, once they get in there, they, I, 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 they may not have to do as much as they're <coughs> anticip I, that we're anticipating on them doing what I understand. 
When you go and remove those cabinets from the wall, you may very well destroy those cabinets. Oh, yes, sir. They, they Can they not destroyed. cut out the back of those cabinets to accomplish the same thing and save our... Well, I'm not a carpenter. I, I don't know. I they're mean, built really good. They're, they're built that really well. That filing cabinet <laughs> is a booger bear. Yeah, and it's and 20 foot long. Cabinet. That thing is huge. It's like a bar top with a cat with filing cabinets built in it. It may come loose all in one piece. I don't know. I don't Again, know. I'm it's heavy. I'm not a carpenter. I apologize for you know. I, I'm just going by with what international telling me that they've got to do. What tax telling me what that we've got to do, and from there, it's up to everybody else. Okay. I mean, not everybody, all of us. So as a bare minimum, not any enhancements, we've got to uh, remove two feet up of sheetrock, pull out or treat the insulation. We've got to put sheetrock back. We've got to tape bed, paint that. We've got to repair or replace the cabinet work. You've got flooring to replace. We've got court. We've got our 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 courtroom, uh, the the podium. Water got up under it, soaked up in the wall in there. The podium is going to have to be taken down. That that is all the worst case scenario. They get in here. I have, they they're supposed to send a team down to do an assessment on for sure what they're going to be doing. But the worst case scenario is everything's going to have to be taken out and rebuilt. Okay. Before we talk about any other work that needs to be done to that building, in addition to just bare minimum damage, we've obviously got to do some relocation of Correct. the two, well, many people. Mm -hmm. The two of you, your staff, two constables. Yes, sir. We, uh, that was one of the, one of the first things that we started doing, uh, just done, uh, been trying we're looking at maybe just getting some portable storage portable office buildings put out next to the location so it'd be better for the you know the customers coming in but we're finding that the price on those what we've got right now is well, was, they were a bit yeah but it's like eight thousand dollars just to transport one building that would house yeah, exactly. one office was seven thousand. Seven thousand. And then ten thousand dollars just to build a ramp to make it ADA accessible. Correct. And then we were going to have to install the then, electrical then, too. Then, then we'll have to install electric, electrical stuff and then run all our internet and phone services to those buildings. So what I've done, and, and I'm not going to speak for just done, but we've located the office here on the first floor across from the county attorney's office. It used to be James's old office. You're speaking for yourself right now? For, for precinct okay. one, three, precinct four. one. My staff can move into there. I can move in there. Constable, I believe, is going to be able to move next door to, to Jones' office where he used to be housed to begin with. All this on a temporary basis. With that, there's going to have to come with some, some, some few small adjustments. For instance, we can't just let the public come in that are irritated. Okay, go go over this again. You're talking about you're talking about the currently vacant office in the in the northwest corner of the main yes, courthouse. Yes, sir. And you said an office next to Joan. I don't know where that is. Uh, it's next to Cheryl, across from the Coke machine. Next to Cheryl, okay, downstairs where... Uh, I do that every time. Okay, I think Paul Lindsay used that as an office for a while I'm down there. Okay, so that takes care of you and your two staff members? Yes, sir. I, and the constable. We're, we'll have to... We may end up having to put some kind of temporary wall into the larger office to accommodate some other things. We don't know that for a fact yet. We haven't got moved in. It's just one of those that we're going to take the bare minimum with us. 
and go from there. But the entrance door, at minimum, needs to be a split door where the public just can't come in. So we have we have pretty heavy traffic. Uh, most of the time, people coming in want to pay tickets, file several cases, and the sorts of that. So that would be a minimum there, and 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 make it safe for you know environmental issues for COVID if everything creeps back up on. It. But it's one of those where. We're going to just going to have to look and see for sure what we can do, but our our intent is to get in there as quick as possible, so the offices will be opened up to, or the justice will be opened up to the, to them to be able to do what they have to do. Do you have any idea how much and and the insurance will pay for in the way of? expenses that I see getting somebody to physically move your furniture and equipment and then making modifications if any to that office mine is, I, I can't speak on the modifications of the office which would be just temporary modifications if 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 that's feasible uh, they will from what I understand from Brett and tack is that they will move us you know pay for the movement they would, they'll pay for rental of things up to a certain amount and only for the abatement part, not for the repairing of anything else in the future. Uh, my understanding is, uh, talking to the adjuster, you just send him everything that, that uh, we do and then he's really has anything that insurance hands on what they cover. So you think you've got your location Determine with the yes. court's approval, you can start moving fairly quickly. Yeah, uh, as uh, with the court's approval, yes. Uh, Seth and I were supposed to uh, get together and look at there, now that for both of us, for both our moves, there's going to be logistics that's got to be taken care of. We got to be sure that we have the phone services that we need, everything transferred. I've talked with them. For, for for my my area, I've talked with Lantana, and there's nothing. Everything should be there for our phones, uh, the computers, uh, the internet. Internet. There's a lots of hookups there. They just have to be checked out. Make sure that they're feasible. Make sure that they're in feasible locations. You may have to make a couple more drops on that. Uh, but that's what Seth and I were going to do today, but apparently he's got tied up into something else, so we're going to look at that after the, okay. the court's meeting. Now, as far as Judge Dunn, I'll let you talk about what you got going. If there's any other questions about the business. Yeah, we may have in a minute. Let's hear, let's hear what the plans are for relocation. Okay, for our office, actually, uh, Commissioner Fitch and Parchman, they've been helping us trying to find a place for us to move our office in actually probation office, correct? Uh, there, They have three offices that we can occupy while they fix in our offices. I believe it's their conference room, is the very front office, and that will be, uh, that will give us access to the public. and. Uh, there is an office right across from that office, which I will be using that one. In. I believe it's at the end, correct? Yeah. Yours? Yeah. So we will be in the same building. The what? Jury room. That jury room over there. Okay, yeah. So just yeah. so we describe, we're talking over there at adult probation, about halfway down that hall, we've got a secure door that goes back to the probation officers and their staff where nobody can access their staff. Uh, except through uh, a security protected door. So everything you're talking about is in the street side of that building. The first building on the right, it's got a glass window on yes. it. Yes. That would house your two ladies. Yes. They and have then, a big, uh, the, uh, it's a conference room, you yeah. know, and they're not using it. And they said that I can actually put the girls right there on the front. And it'll be better because people come and make payments or whatever. Right. And they will not have to go across, you know, from the halls trying to find the other offices. 
and then your office would be the second office on the left next to Melody Thompson who is Cole's uh, staff. It's uh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And then Ray would be officed in what I still call the jury room was going to one time be the jury room where it's got a long table in there and a brick wall. Uh, so that that none of those three offices are currently occupied by no. anybody in adult and they, probation. They said that we can uh, stay there. You know, we I think for only three to four months before they finish fixing the building, and they said that we can stay that long. Okay. Okay. That will not be a problem. So that's a better alternative than the portable building. I mean, we're still trying to get some uh, prices. We're still waiting on people to send us some information. But if they don't get anything or if it's too high, you know, I mean, we already have a place to go. And I believe it's better. I bet there's a lot of demand for those portable buildings after the storm for people having to relocate. Okay. Those portable buildings are ridiculously high. They wanted 28000 just for a, a 12 by 44 building. That's the setup cost. Yeah, there's a lot of work involved in that setup and then bringing electricity to it, bringing. just to build a ramp, a handicap ramp to it. But they did say that we could do that on our own if we wanted to, just to find out what the city requires. Uh, but that would say 10, they wanted 10000 just for that. So we could save that 10000 Well, whether it's insurance money or whether it's our money, I appreciate you finding alternatives to, to that and trying to save some, some money there. It's going to cost very little to move over here because one thing I think we need a split door for where the funds are going to be, and other than that, it's similar to what Steve was talking about. Us. Yeah, and, and that way the people will not have access, you know, to go directly to the girls because sometimes we can have really angry people, you know, or people with some issues, and we just yeah. need to keep them a little bit far, you know, probably. The wall, I mean, the flip door and maybe a plexi, you know, if it's possible, right there at the door. What I would start doing at least is talking to Brett and finding out, you know, put, get your wish list put together and say, hey, we're, we're saving you from having to bring a portable building up here. We're going to use existing offices. What can you do? What will you pay for to allow us to modify these offices mm -hmm. to our needs? And, and the more we can put on the insurance tab, the better. Yes. But if you're working with them and obviously saving them money by using existing county offices, I mean, that's better for him. But yes. start keeping the list of all those things that you think need to be done I'll, and see, I'll, see I'll what he's him. willing to pay for. I'll, I'll make a list today, and then I'll give him a call to, to say, here, tell him what our plans are what we're looking at, the outrageous cost of this, he, uh, and if it saves him money, I don't see why I can put and go with it either. But anyway, I'll get some clarification on that. One other thing is that uh, over here, we would, you know, we're not going to have a courtroom to have hearings. So what hearings that we have to do with the public when they can't do Zoom, uh, we'll, we'll have to have some kind of, we'll have to make accommodations for that. Now, whether it be... Uh, um, we can use here, this courtroom here a lot, you know, and then would, would maybe just have to schedule the other jury room at the annex or their court. Well, the reality is this room is used for commissioner's court. We use it twice a month for docket call for mm -hmm. pretrial and I've been using it regularly for probate hearings just mm -hmm. to give plenty of room between myself and, and the folks that are needing to handle uh, wills and estates but by and large I'm, I don't see any reason you couldn't use well, this. Well that, that would be that would be convenient for us and uh, Judge Dunn as well. Uh, we've get, we have it set up in our courtroom there were if an individual doesn't have access to Zoom or unable to to operate Zoom, whatever the need is, but they have to be present for us to be able to see. We we've got a laptop that we just hook up and they sit in the courtroom by themselves, of course with the, the constable. On does that reading. does that schedule change from day to day? Do you tend to have 
No, sir. It, it, so we, we, could, we, we, could we, can, we can find out when dates the courts are open, and we can schedule within those times. The only, the only thing that we have a time frame on is for our evictions. And on evictions, they're no less than 10 days, no more than 21 days. With the pandemic, we have some leeway with that, but I'm tending to think that since the governor's lifting in the statewide mandate, I, the the court may start uh, take that liberty away from us as far as extending due to the COVID. Uh, in fact, this weekend I got a uh, training center sent out an email saying that. Uh, Jury proceedings can go start uh, coming up real soon, uh, as long as Judge Ralston approves that our minimum, what what he requires is our minimum requirement. So that's already in the process of changing. Uh, we would still have to offer Zoom uh, if anybody requests Zoom. I mean, we have to offer it in, if they want. To do it Zoom, we'll still do it Zoom. But. Well, you don't have a jury box in this courtroom. I don't know if you'd be able to utilize any of the courtrooms over there at the annex for that, or would they, you have to delay your jury we, trials the, until you're finished? I'm not sure, preparing? Chris. Who uh, somebody we was talking to was talking about that the courtrooms over there is going to start getting filled up pretty quick with jury. Uh, proceedings and stuff. Who, do you remember who that was? We'll, 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 we'll make it work. I mean, we just gotta move everybody out here and the jury in here. Yeah. But as of right now, we don't have any jury trials that we need to set up. Okay. Other than traffic violations. And okay. There. Well, that yeah. That the can. only thing that cannot wait is just like you said, evictions. You know, we can hold on to the other hearings until the state. We like, you know, our local small claims and stuff like that. We try to, like, we try to get out of the way as quick as possible. But, but you could use this courtroom to to, to limp along for a while, anyway. Yep. Okay. Sounds like it's a bare minimum. You need us to authorize you to start moving your staff and equipment as quickly as possible to the areas that you've identified. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe Commissioner Fitch made you know, said we can get us a hiring. Uh, hire a uh, uh, moving company to come move what we, the bare minimum that we need up here. But the thing is, is there's a lot of other stuff that we're going to have to store. Yeah. And that is either going to have to be in a storage facility, storage building put out there that's secure, uh, or something that's... Something about a container or something, but I figured we'd just get... Containers, on-site containers. Yeah, we could cool. do that, or we could find some mini storage around here and just have move everything off site somewhere. Did you say something about the old jail? It's full. It's full. Full of the top of all kinds of records and equipment. So went over there and it's pretty uh, busy over yeah, there. But you think Brett will authorize the hiring of a mover to do that for you? I will call him here just shortly and and, and get that. Uh, if if not then I'm sorry. Inmate, Inmate crew. crew. I would rather have professionals move you. I would too. Uh, they would have the liability on it. You know. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not near as young as I used to be. And. and uh, <laughs> okay. Well, there's a lot of details under these yeah. general headings that we're talking about now. Let's move on to the subject that we got started on last week, which was while we're going to all the trouble to move all your staff and all your equipment and furniture out of those offices, what else do we need to do to that building that may not have anything to do with damage? It may have something to do with water damage. It may not, but talking about needed improvements to that building that yes. have been a problem for a while and what we've done so far just to inform everybody we got a couple of experts over there 
Um, Carl Smith with Heritage Constructors happens to be a friend of mine. I didn't contact him. That's who Steve Dunn, your husband, works for. Mm -hmm. And so Carl contacted me. Carl came over and met with one of his employees. Was that last Monday or last? It was last week. It, it was last week, week sometime. Yeah, I'm not sure what day it is. Was. Um, but some of the ideas that I had weren't necessarily on track with what he, he felt like needed to be done. And then on Friday afternoon, I know you met with Glenn Calvert, who we have worked with before, who is a structural engineer that works for Prefort. I know that you and Commissioner Fitch met with him. And in fact, I think he's supposed to come and actually address the court at here 10, at 10, 10, 10 30 or so. So, um, what are some of the things that you think we need to do to that building while we've got all this work going on? And please add anything that I may forget. Uh, first of all, uh, the cooling and heating system in there is horrible. Uh, the the intake vents are in odd places. The one room may stay warm one room, while the other one stays cold. Uh, I think we need to look at the air conditioning systems throughout, and there's three units there. Uh, two offices don't have air conditioning? Two offices don't have fix air that. conditioners. The, uh, well, they, they have small they have, yeah, they have window, window units. Small window yeah. units that are fairly aged and uh, that. I'm not sure that all the exterior walls even have insulation in them. I just by feeling of them how cool they are, that or the insulation is just falling down from areas. The at the above the ceiling tiles, the uh, uh, water pipe that busted is just a three-quarter inch uh, copper line. <coughs> It needs to be insulated in a different manner. Uh, it needs to have a either heat trace of some sort of along it and larger bundle of uh, insulation and the little foam stuff just for show, really. Inside the the the, the tin roof, as it is, after getting up and looking during all the damage and stuff. The metal roof itself doesn't have but look like maybe a no more than a half inch of foam insulation that's been sprayed up there. Uh, at the end of the eaves around the building with this corrugated uh, metal roof, there, the caps on the roofs themselves at the end do not block open air from coming into the roof, into the attic area. The uh, uh, Carl, was it Carl? It was, uh, Carl who was Smith. It? I'm sorry. Carl Smith. Yeah, uh, he, uh, Cal, Mr. Cal. No, Glenn Cal. Glenn. Glenn looked at some of it and he said, well, those really don't need to be open. They figured maybe they kept them open for the attic to breathe, but on each end of the building there's vents there already. So we got open air just coming in over uh, eye beams, uh, 12 inch eye beams that are used as the main rafters. We, we did put those fans in the end of those buildings in the last 10 years, and part of the reason we did that was to relieve some of the heat load in that attic that was, I thought, creating a lot of the heat load on that building. It got mm -hmm. so hot up there because there was no ventilation in there. And in fact, we didn't even have insulation on top of that drop ceiling until oh, nine, I, I, nine years well, ago. And so those, those are two of the things that we've attempted to do. Mm -hmm. We put the insulation bats on top of the drop ceiling. That helped a little bit. Then Robert's 
air conditioning put those vents at the ends of the building to try to pull some of the hot air out there. Mm -hmm. It may have helped a little bit, but it's still very difficult to heat. I'm not cool even sure if those building. fans even still run. Huh? I, did, I, I thought it was just vents, was, not. you know, open air vents. Um, basically, that uh, when they go in and start stripping the the whatever amount of Cheap rock comes off the building. It right here he is right here. Morning, Glenn. Uh, they're going to have to come back and replace that, whether it be a four foot piece or the whole wall to trace out. It's going to have to be replaced. But that would be insurance stuff. There, we could. I'm sure itemize what would be insurance replacement cost before anything else would be done. <coughs> what else? What about flooring? Flooring, uh, the carpet in there, the, uh, of course there's not any carpet in there except for just a little bit left in Judge Dunn's office. Uh, looking at going down with tile floor with it of some sort, whether it be the laminate strips or regular tile. Why don't we take a break there and be respectful of Glenn Calvert's time and let him tell us about his visit on uh, on Friday so that we can get you in and out. So this is Glenn Calvert who has helped us before, most recently on our uh, re rebuild of our porch steps around the courthouse um, and getting the coatings on those and those have done real well for us. But thank you very much for coming to my rescue and going and looking at that building on Friday and uh, we met with Steve and with uh, Fitch here. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> Well, I think there's two things as was sounds like it was being described, kind of an insurance adjustment situation, as well as the thought that as long as everyone's going to be displaced during that repair from the insurance issue, whether or not uh, the county wants to do any upgrades to the overall building is what I got out of it. Uh, in particular, we talked about HVAC issues and maybe some upgrades on finishes. Um, I was not sure, and I believe Commissioner Fitch actually called someone and asked them about whether or not a project like that would need to be uh, um, advertised to contractors to bid on, and I think what you understood from your conversation was that at least preliminarily that it would not have to be. I think that's a key thing to nail down so that you know the appropriate steps that would have to go through. Um, we did talk about some HVAC work that would, if the, if the building upgrade is done, HVAC work that would be uh, part of that process or part of that scope of work. And one of the things that we talked about Friday was whether or not an engineer needed to be involved with that. There are state regulations related to the retaining of an engineer and it's not something that it's a different type of engineering than what we do but one of the things and I've actually brought a copy of this that I'll share with you and judge I emailed these charts to you today the state has put together flow charts that if you answer yes or no questions regarding your particular project it'll come down to whether the state is going to require an architect or an engineer on the project. And one of the items that we talked about was um, HVAC upgrades. And anytime you do HVAC upgrades, it doesn't take long to spend, you know, a decent amount of money. And the, the, the threshold that the state calls for HVAC work is only $8,000. If you spend more than $8,000, you've got to have an engineer involved with it. So my recommendation if that is what you want to do, would be to have an engineer look at the building, look at zoning, and come up with a repair, or not a repair, but a replacement of what you've got. Uh, that would include things like insulating the building. One of the things we saw is there's bat insulation right on top of the drop ceiling, which is like the, it's the cheapest way to insulate a building, but you also get what you pay for. That building is not insulated very well at all. And based on what you guys have said about the um, 
about the utility bills in the summer and what you described whenever you go over there in the summer is not doing a very good job of keeping that building cool. So we looked at possibly, uh, or at least talked about insulating the bottom of the deck with a spray foam insulation, which would really improve that um, building as far as being airtight and able to cool it in the wintertime. And also, it'd be easier to heat in the wintertime so that your pipe and the ceiling don't burst next time it freezes, hopefully. So uh, there are some advantages to that, but um, I guess the summary of all that is that if the county does want to proceed with not only addressing the ins insurance issues, but also upgrading the building, according to the state, there needs to be a mechanical engineer involved. We've got names that we can provide with you. We just got through doing something very similar to this at the police station here for the city. I don't see this project being nearly as involved as that project was. Um, there was also some discussion about replacing, instead of pulling up carpet and replacing the carpet, you talked about, okay, maybe we just need to put tile in some areas for longer durability. Um, you talked about potentially upgrading some of the finishes so it looks more like the vehicle registration building over here and all of those things I, th I guess are things up for discussion which if you got a contractor in there, you'd have to, have to either point and tell them what to do or you'd have to have a set of drawings to, to, for them to build off of. So my recommendation would be if that's the route you go for those building upgrades related to finishes to have you know a basic floor plan with finishes shown in it so that they know what they're pricing and you know what you're getting whenever you get a price. On the HVAC upgrades, According to the state, and I think it makes sense. I, I don't. I don't doubt that there's a lot of mechanical contractors that would go that could go in there and do a, a great job. But according to the state, if it's going to be public money, you've got to retain an engineer. And but it's not. It's, it's not going to be a huge assignment, regardless of how you go about doing it. The construction cost is going to be a lot more expensive. And, and when I say a lot more, it's not like it's. It's not going to be a ton of money. They spent a lot of a lot of money repairing what they did at the police station. As I said, this isn't nearly as involved as that was. But um, I think, as far as the zoning and the design of the systems, especially given the insulation that would potentially be done, I think it makes sense. And the state requires a mechanical engineer involved with it. Do we have any of those mechanical engineers in Mount Pleasant? I may be wrong, but I am not aware of a mechanical engineer in Mount Pleasant. I wasn't aware either. The one that we're used, that not we, but the one that the city uses is actually out of Gilmer. And okay. uh, he's done a few other jobs around here. Okay. All right. Um, while we're at it, I think it makes sense to just do a life safety plan of that. Uh, make sure we're alarmed correctly and make sure we have all the exits pathways and all that stuff that's just kind of good sense as long as we're doing this um, the state also requires if you do any renovation uh, to a building that the ADA uh, accesses and dimensions are right and I don't have any reason to doubt that they're not but it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to check that as well where does a project like that start uh, hiring I mean, you don't start hiring a general contractor when you don't even have job description or scope of work yeah. prepared. Who, who would prepare something like that? Well, um, the first thing you've got, the way I understand it, there's been uh, an insurance adjuster in there to look at the water damage. So I would get that in hand and find out what they're going to cover and what they're not. And then based on what they're not going to cover as compared to what you want to do, whether it's upgrade or whatever, I would take their base settlement and statement and that would kind of merge into a set of documents that would be an overall. For instance, um, based on what we heard the other day, and this is second hand, but this I think this is what you heard is that the insurance people are going to cut all the sheetrock up to two feet above the floor. So that's something they're going to do on the demolition side and they probably would pay for the repair of those two feet. Uh, so that repair, I would think, would need to be included in a set of documents that whoever comes in there to do the work needs to finish the, the remediation work. So I would find out what they're going to do first and then merge that into a set of other documents. And 
the other documents, the other set of documents really needs to be uh, to reflect what the commissioners decide they want to do with that building, whether they just want to patch it and paint it and go down the road or whether they want to fix the insurance problems, do some upgrades on finishes, going back in with tile versus carpet. That won't be a dollar per dollar trade out. It'll cost you more to put tile than what the insurance is going to pay for the carpet more than likely. Um, but then also have included in that set of documents a, um, a mechanical plan that shows what the mechanical engineer uh, prescribes for that. So the first thing I would do is get the insurance adjustment in hand and find out what they're going to do and make a decision as to what you want to do as a commissioner's court with that building and then put together a set of documents that can be looked at by contractors that are proposing on the work. The other thing is, and this was another question I had for you the other day, and I don't know if this was actually mentioned whenever you talked to whoever it was you're talking to, but you know, it is public money, so it likely would have to be a bonded project, in my opinion, but I may be wrong since it started with an emergency, you know, an insurance issue. But that would be a question for the county attorney. Okay. What, uh, in, in the role that you played for us prior, describe a role that you could or, or, or couldn't play in a project like this. Um, If there is renovation involved and if there are details that need to be done to show finishes, I would start with a, a floor plan, like I said, so that people could actually look at the work and give you real budget numbers or, or bids on the work. Uh, we did ask about whether or not there were any existing uh, drawings of the building as it sits now, and as far as we know, there's not, so I think I would we, we may looked, have. We looked, I got, yeah, I got real, one more room look. to go through of a bunch of records, and we okay. believe there's. Yeah, I think that would be a start. There, so uh, I'll get that today. But I think to answer your question, I think somebody would need to draw a floor plan that would show path of egress for life safety, alarming. You know, that same document could be used by the mechanical engineer for you know designing his HVA systems. There needs to be a set of documents so that people can bid on the work for things like spray foam insulation and demolition. And there needs to be some sort of a floor plan for people to work off of. You know, and if the commissioner commission wanted us to do that, we could. But that's, you know, entirely up to you guys. Okay. Well, it sounds like, uh, guys, we're going to have decisions that are going to be on a regular basis and probably more necessary than just every couple of weeks when we meet. So may, we probably should plan on meeting a couple of times a week, uh, maybe meet again Friday uh, this week, depending upon what we find out from the insurance company. So just remember that uh, we may need to work that into your schedules. Well, Glenn, thanks very much for looking at that building out there. So you like the idea of spray foam insulation in the bottom of that roof or what you're calling the deck. Does that do away with the need for that bad insulation on top of the ceiling? That would be the goal, yes. And then that way you somewhat conditioned that space above right. yeah. so that our pipes don't get frozen <clears throat> mm -hmm. again. At least yeah. you have some insulation capability in there. Yeah. Yeah, that would help. Do you have an opinion on the insulation in the walls, whether we need to do anything more than the two feet? It'll be interesting to see what ha what, they, what it looks like whenever they pull that two feet of drywall off around the perimeter. <clears throat> you know, you hate to say it, but if it was in water, that insulation wicks water up the wall. So I think one of the things that, uh, uh, that John said was that, you know, they would start with two feet and go until they until they got any one or two material. walls will be all the way up or really got Say what? Soaked. Steve's office that whole wall's probably got to be removed that bathroom wall that had that down where it turned down and was leaking was that above the ceiling line that wall may have got some water in it it was right by the wall uh-huh so, so yes we'll have a lot exposed on one side depending on the office you know if it's interior you may or might not even need insulation in that. Probably not. You may want to have like a 
sound bat insulation in some of those walls for discussions that need to be kept in the walls. Uh, but it just remains to be seen what's exposed whenever they pull that sheetrock off. But you know, if you've got someone there spraying foam insulation on the roof, they could very easily spray in whatever's exposed in the ceiling all at once. So into the walls, you mean? In the okay. well, exterior walls. As long as there's something to spray against, you can do that. <coughs> So we may not know the answer to the, to the adequacy of the insulation in the walls until they remove the two feet. You know, and if, if you want to get ahead of the game some, that is something that remains to be seen, but there's no reason why you can't have like floor plans being developed now, mechanical engineer getting his stuff done and designed, and you could even bid this work without even knowing the full extent of the removal as long as during the bid process you were to get a unit price for okay for every every 10 square feet of wall it's going to be x amount of dollars and that's part of the bid process so that he's, you've got a way to build a project or build work being done as it's being discovered so anytime you get into a uh, remediation type project there's always a few unknowns and that would be probably the main <coughs> unknown of this is you don't know, really know what's going to be uncovered until you uncover it. So if you're going to wait to know all the knowns, the whole process won't be able to start until all of the demolition work by the insurance adjusting is done. So it might be a way to get a little ahead of the game on that. You know, obviously a lot, uh, we're somewhat limited on time, but more on expertise. Do we need a project manager to oversee something like this? What is it? I think more than anything, uh, as far as the commission is concerned, is have a point of contact. And again, we're not trying to sell services here, uh, but I would, if, if the commissioners wanted us to do it, we could arrange for it and kind of be the conduit of information for you guys, uh, you know, as we go forward with it, if that's what you want to do. But yeah, you got to have someone. It just doesn't happen. So. All right, so that we can let Glenn go as soon as possible. Anybody have questions for him before we let him go? Sure appreciate you taking time today and Friday. I'm going to leave this with you. I emailed this to you, okay. but this is kind of the roadmap as to whether or not an engineer. There, there's two sheets, there's one for engineers and one for architecture. Two different groups put this together. And you can see the yes or no questions all the way through there. I kind of highlighted the roadmap through their flow chart as to whether an architect is involved or whether, and I should say, and whether an engineer is involved. I went through the flow chart and it shows that an architect is not required for this project, but an engineer is. So okay. that same chart can be used for any projects in the county. And again, that's because you're spending public money. The, the idea here is to get competent. Uh, contractors working on it so that you end up with a final product that is uh, you has utilized those public funds the best way possible. Correct. And I think the first question of both of those, both the engineer chart and the architect chart, is it a public or private project? If it's public, it goes one direction. If it's private, it goes the other directions. And then there's just no question all the way through the flow chart, and it will either summarize the yes, engineer and architect, or no, you don't. Know, Thank you. All right. Last call. All right. Well, I appreciate you. Appreciate you the other afternoon, too. Thank you. Okay. So where, where, do, where do we start? I think first we start with uh, a good, clear direction from Brett as to what they're going to pay for and how they want it done. I can address some of that, maybe little words that let you know where it's kind of confusing with me. Uh, Brett said that the county can do what the county wants to do. It just depends on whether they pay for it or not. 
Well, <laughs> that's, and I we know that. that. <laughs> I mean, as far as what the insurance will pay for. I don't for, think the so, county yeah. wants to do anything that's not that's going to bump us out of ref, uh, of payment insurance. by the insurance right. company. Right. And I'll, like I said, I'll get, get in contact with Brett and get you an answer back on that. Well, I'm almost thinking that. Uh, You know, we meet back again tomorrow within 24 hours on this particular item before we close it out so that we can know what direction to go in. I hate to wait until Friday, but it may take you a few days. But if I'm going to go beyond tomorrow, I need to post an agenda. And the soonest I can post an agenda would be for, for Thursday. I will get up as soon as I leave here, I will call Brett and tell him again, explain to him what we're looking at and what they're going to pay for us as far as moving us, uh, moving us back, uh, and see what Possibly what some pods or something to put our furniture we can't move. And as we tear out a few things, we can put it in a pod or a storage container. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we have to run across town and put it somewhere. Get a big vein in on side. Be right in and out. I'll do that to get through here. Okay. Well, what do you think about that? How about we uh, we take care of all the other business on this agenda, but instead of adjourn and finishing this meeting, we postpone or, or we, we continue. We uh, What's the word that I'm looking for? We recess until tomorrow, listen to Steve and Irma again, um, and then maybe that will help us to make our I next, do have next decision. I court tomorrow morning at, at 10 o'clock. Could we meet at 9? Yes, sir. Okay. How does that sound? Sounds good to me. Okay. Well, we will uh, pick up discussion again tomorrow on item number 9. Uh, and after we do that, we'll either continue it again or we'll, we'll close out this meeting. So we'll set item 9 aside for right now. Let's move on to item number 10 while we're talking Thank about you. construction. Thank you all. David, is, David Holmes has been talking to me for some time about the, the needs at our deteriorating public restrooms at the courthouse annex. We have the two large restrooms there in the central corridor there next to the uh, clerk's office and to the entrance to the courtroom. Then we have in the back far left corner, the southeast corner, we've got two small public restrooms that are typically used by uh, folks that are coming in for jury selection. Um, maybe the sometimes the, the uh, DA use those, but I doubt if they do now because they're not very pleasant. And what David has been recommending, he's shown me over there a couple of times, uh, he asked Big Dog Construction to give him a price, and they walked through there. And let me kind of discuss what the, this proposal includes. And again, mostly it was directed by David. But the Annex Men's and Women's, uh, I'm gonna, this is going to be the larger restrooms there by the clerk's office. This would be minor demo to the existing vanities in both the men's and women's lavatories. If, you'll, if you're familiar with those restrooms, they have formica tops and formica legs with the two sinks set in those and the plumbing underneath. Uh, the suggestion would be to remove all of that old uh, worn out formica uh, woodwork that's there that needs to be redone and replace it with a total of four sinks, two and two that would be wall-mounted ADA compliant sinks either with or without a pedestal below them if they could be adequately secured to the walls. This would be much like the restrooms uh, here, for example, you don't have any under-counter uh, woodwork or, uh, or for mica tops, you just have the sinks themselves. That would include plumbing for both of those lavatories to those four sinks. Um, 
that's really all that needs to be done in there. The, the larger toilets, the urinals, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The separation hardware between the individual toilets, the Privacy. stalls themselves are okay. So this really we're just focusing on the vanities in both the men and women's restroom there. Now we move back to courtroom B where you have a similar situation. You just have a single sink in there that's got formica top and formica down below. That wood is rotten, it stinks, you can't get the smell out of there. Uh, so it doesn't just need a doesn't just need to be whitewashed with more formica. That woodwork needs to be removed out of there. So he proposes minor demo to the existing vanities in both the men's and women's lavatories. Minor construction to remove the sheetrock and apply new. The reason there is to install a backer uh, stud to mount those ADA sinks to the walls. Take texture and paint to match the existing color. Uh, redo the plumbing to both of those sinks. Uh, David has got, David Holmes has some uh, fixtures that he thinks he could use, so county would supply those fixtures, and these are new that he bought on sale with those projects in mind some time back. And then, uh, of course, the labor and material to install those ADA compliant wall mounted sinks. So, two restrooms. A total of six sinks, two, two, and then one, one in the back, and removal of the wood and the formica tops that are back there, and going with wall-mounted or pedestal-type uh, sinks there. Um, $3,350. I thought that was a pretty good price considering that I have looked at this project with uh, both David and then with John with Big Dog. I thought that was a reasonable price for what we get. Uh, we want to, in my opinion, spend as little money as we can on that building for now, but this will get those restrooms where they don't uh, stink, where they're not an eyesore, and they actually look decent. David would continue to try to refurbish those restaurant rooms with some painting as needed of the uh, of the stall walls there, especially back there by courtroom B. The, the other one is not so bad. And then there needs to be some new, uh, and David could do this, he says, some new can lights and LED lights in those courtroom B restrooms because it's so dark in there, there's not adequate lighting and the bulbs need to be replaced with something different than what's in there right now. But for $3,300, that's what we can get done. I strongly recommend this. I, you know, David said he would do his best to try to do this work. That David's got plenty to do other than trying to be a carpenter and get in there, and, and he offered to do that, uh, you know, nights and weekends, just as a, as a separate deal. And there we get into problems with, uh, with, with overtime. It's not really legal to do it that way. David's not a, a insured uh, contractor or carpenter, although I have a lot of confidence in what David can do. Um, I'm just not sure that I can find a comfortable way where I can be paying him as an employee and paying him as a contractor at the same time, and this will enable a contractor to get in and get out of there quickly. Any questions, I'll do my best to answer, or I'll give you additional time to go look at these restrooms and formulate your own opinion or you can turn this project down, or you can approve it. So do you have any questions? Yes, ma'am. It would be tight with it. Would it be at the end when the contract is complete, or would it be draw or anything like that? Uh, on a small job like this, I would hope that it could all be paid for at the end, but I don't know the answer to that. I guess we could talk with uh, the contractor and find out about that. There might be maybe one draw in there. I don't, I just don't see a $3,300 job as being that significant, but uh, John McDermott may feel otherwise. I think it's well-deserved work needs to be done so i make a motion we approve it and why don't you throw in there to answer barbara's question how you would propose to pay for this would you be willing to uh 
have one draw prior to completion and then payment in full upon satisfactory approval? Yes, I'd be willing to do that draw on it before and then one on approval after it's finished. We'll see if Mr. McDermott's okay with that, it that way. why he wouldn't be, I think that that's reasonable. So the motion is to approve this quote of $3,350 to Big Dog who is currently working over there at that building uh, with the uh, approval of one single mid-project draw and then payment in full upon completion. I second. Second by Commissioner Parchman. Any discussions or comments or questions here? All in favor say aye. 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 Item number 11, we had uh, submitted by J.C. White Funeral Home a, haven't had one of these in a while, this is a uh, request for payment of a pauper's funeral. Our policy typically in the past has been deviated somewhat, but generally speaking, the pauper's funeral payment was designed to pay for the minimal charges of a funeral home when we had uh, an individual that was deceased that did not have family or friends uh, within the community to pay for this service. Here we have one, which many of these are. We have, uh, unfortunately, financial circumstances of family as such that they are unable to pay. And here we have a funeral home that I guess has already done the work. They're asking for $950, but the decedent's name is Kena, K-E-N-A, Boyd. And Kena Boyd uh, passed away, I'm not sure how long ago, date of death, January 5th of this year. So the cremation has already occurred. Her husband, and I can't even read his signature, is the one that filled out this application for payment of a pauper's funeral there in the presence of, of J.C. White. And this standard form that we have, I, the undersigned, hereby state that I was related to the deceased as their, in this case, husband. I further state neither the deceased nor any person responsible for the deceased had any assets such as money, bank accounts, investment, insurance, property, or any other assets which are applied to the cost of the funeral. In other words, they're saying, I don't have anything, don't have any ability to pay. So this one's a little bit different in that we do have a family member here. Don't know if there are other family members. All I know is what I see here. And so I caution you that if you approve one of these, you do open the door for uh, payment of future financial hardship situations and where you draw the line, I don't, I don't know. These, this is obviously a needy family situation and we have a funeral home that's out that expense that you would be reimbursing. The family doesn't make any money off of this and whether or not they can be held liable by the funeral home, I don't know. So again, try to, trying to stay in keeping with what the county can and cannot do with public funds as it relates to financial hardship situations in a, uh, in a cremation, you have to weigh that against whether this is a legitimate use of county funds for a pauper's funeral. I make a motion we deny payment on it. Motion is made by Commissioner Fitch. Pay it since they're married and have family. Okay, there is a second, and so that I can explain this to uh, that is, uh, the husband has not spoken with me. In fact, I've not spoken with anybody. We just got a, we just got this. What was did did, uh, did he fax this to us, James, or bring it by? J.C. White Funeral Home just faxed us this. So we, I know no more details other than what I'm seeing here. So I have a motion and a second to deny payment of 
this $950. And the rationale that I will pass on is uh, we reserve the instances where there are residential families. Mm -hmm. In this case, we see family here. We know no other details here. That's the reason for the denial. Okay, motion and a second. All in favor of denial, say aye. Aye. Uh, yeah. Opposed? Yeah, those, those are tough ones. Yeah, we haven't tough, had one tough. in a while, but they will, we, we get them from time to time. Item number 12, consider and possibly approve a, the survey of the Forest Lawn Cemetery to include four new burial sections, not just burial plots, but burial sections. This is out at Forest Lawn. And Commissioner Fitch, why don't you tell us what's going on out there at Forest Lawn and what this expansion need uh, is this for. Okay, so Forest Lawn Cemetery is a actual real perpetual care cemetery that is regulated by the state, state banking commission and they have a cemetery division there where every other cemetery in the county is uh, regulated by an association which is either owned by that association or a church and we have local uh, citizens who manage funds that are donated to that cemetery for its uh, upkeep and care where uh, Forest Lawn is a uh, cemetery regulated by the state which is uh, owned by an individual as a business and they had to require them, uh, they get audited once a year, they require 10% of uh, lot sales and such to go into a fund that keeps that cemetery perpetual care and they manage that. So what they have done, the original cemetery is about 16, 16 acres that was started in the 50s. It was designed to bury, uh, have lots in these four sections but they never were surveyed and numbered with each particular lot. So each particular lot gets a number, a plot, a block that it's on, and we supply a deed uh, as a legal form of paperwork for those lots as they sell them. The families a hold on to those deeds and they can sell them amongst each other or uh, to any individual. Uh, most of them they buy directly from the cemetery. And what they have done is they went from uh, a 42 by 7 foot, 42 inch by 7 foot lot to a 5 foot by 10 foot lot with some walkways in it. And that reduced their lots in, that, in those areas to give more space for some trees, um, maybe upright headstones in the future. I don't know what their plans are. And they also took one section of ground there and they put in about like 5 foot by 5 foot lots which will hold cremains that are real popular now and they have probably hold several on one of those plots and uh, they'll have their own rules for how they want to mark those graves so all we're doing is they got with a cemetery planning company and they had them surveyed they have them marked with stainless steel markers with numbers and plots and uh, it's all even on gps um, they drew up the surveys. They all look correct to me. And as we have copies of them, as people come and get deeds to say lot G8304, we'll know where that lot is from now on. And they have records of what lots where there's people buried in them, lots that people just own those lots, and then lots that are unsold so there's no confusion. And so we're just basically today approving these uh, plats uh, on uh, these lots. And they turn that into the cemetery commission with the state banking commission. And they'll have their records and all these records look to be legit and up to date. Is this an expansion of the total property of Forest No, the total property has, is, has expanded. They bought 35 acres uh, that they haven't utilize yet except they put a shop and a maintenance facility on it and they can use that property in the future they'll come back and do this same thing they'll survey it they'll uh, put how many lots are going to be in a new section which they won't have to do for several years this is quite a few lots out there uh, how many total is that i didn't add, i didn't add them up but at one time uh those lot just off the top of my head those that would have been about 
1,600 lots or something. Changing them to five by 10 is going to make it about 1,200 lots, and I'm not sure how many cremain lots. It looks so like burial, several hundred. A burial section will hold about 300 burial sites? Uh, depending on how big the burial sections are out there. This, this, uh, this cemetery has strips of land, big squares, small squares. So, yeah. Well, a burial so, section isn't uh, a defined uh, size. It, it usually it's broken down into like, uh, so it's going to be in uh, section H. That's that whole, you know, third of an acre size section. And then it's going to be plot, which is a, a group of 20 lots. And then lot number, which is one of those 20 lots in that plot. So, okay. yeah. So, pretty legit stuff. We just had to have records for the, for the State Banking Commission. And for some reason, we had to have you sign off on them. And they register them with the county clerk, and they're good to go. So. It looks good. It's going to be nice. A lot of good improvements out there at the cemetery. That's so become one of the it's, nicest. It's nice, and, town, and really for, for Titus County in general, just because I, here's, here's what I can tell you. Uh, the city is not going to have any more cemeteries in the future. So what they have left as far as plots at Cortinez Cemetery and Edwards Cemetery and Masonic Cemetery, which is kind of private, owned anyway by individuals there's no more room and they're not going to get in the cemetery business and in most of our country cemeteries that the churches and associations help manage are pretty full there's a little bit of growth here and there where they'll add an acre or two over the last few years Neville's Chapel may grow just a little bit more they acquired some more land East New Hope acquired some land but it's pretty hard to do and as the future planning is uh, Forest Lawn's going to be Probably pretty popular. So, all right. I make a motion that we approve the new plots and the lot numbers for Forest Lawn. The original name to that cemetery, the official name with Texas State is Mount Pleasant Memorial Park. So, when you're looking that up with Banking Commission cemetery records, it's called Mount Pleasant Memorial Park. And we know it is Forest Lawn. Commissioner Fitch makes a motion to approve this survey of Forest Lawn Cemetery that is the addition of four new burial sections. Second, Commissioner Parchman. Any questions, comments, discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, this needs my signature. Uh -huh. it need the rest There's the small copies in there and big copies. It's just a judge only, I'm pretty sure. Well, let me, I'll check it. Item number 13, approve oral and written reports. You've been provided uh, by those documents previously by Barbara. Make a motion we approve the reports. Motion to approve. Commissioner Fitch. Second. Who was that? Commissioner Parker. All in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Item 14 is our treasurer's report provided to you by Cheryl. Motion to approve. Motion to approve the treasurer's report. Commissioner Applewhite. All in favor say aye. Aye. Give you a second. I second I'm trying to speed things up. <laughs> Commissioner Fitch seconds. All in favor say aye. Aye. We can choose. We do anything for Cheryl. Item, uh, item 15, budget amendment. Not today. Item number 15. Item 16, sign pay orders and approve payment of our bills. Make a motion. Motion to do so by Commissioner Parchment. Second. And a second by Commissioner Fitch. All in favor of paying those bills say aye. 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 Opposed? Your signature.
future on those. Okay, any, uh, any closing comments? Uh, my closing comments would be, gosh, we've got a, what may not sound like a bit too big of a project over there at the JP office. This is a major disruption for, uh, you know, four elected officials and their staff. And uh, we want to do this project right. We want to be responsible with every dollar that we spend over there. Um, I'm personally a little bit hesitant to do any enhancements on that building in the way of uh, finishes and, and doors and such, but I do think that it would be wise to get that building shored up in the way of keeping it heated and cooled. And I can personally attest to you that building does not do well in the summertime or in the wintertime, at least not in that main courtroom there. And that was one of the things that I saw years ago when we looked at that uh, and what we were going to do about insulating that ceiling. And we've tried multiple things. We tried putting the bats in the roof. We tried to uh, put the ventilation on the ends of the building, and it did help a little bit. But uh, So I hope that you all will keep an open mind to doing some additional work beyond what the insurance is going to pay for but yet doing it in a responsible way where we don't, where we're not wasteful, but we do get an enhanced uh, product there and a building that will last us. That building needs to go another 25 years, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, or at least until we can uh, do something with our annex building. Uh, and at that time, we talk about maybe bringing JPs into a new justice center and we would have that additional building either to, to sell or use for some other purpose. But it's, uh, there are several things I think we can get a lot of bang for our buck by doing the work while we've got everybody out of that building. Um, as you know, the governor, uh, as of Monday, uh, excuse me, Wednesday morning, two days from now, has lifted the state mandate, his requirement uh, mandating wearing of masks. I think that uh, many of our local businesses and churches are going to continue to do that. I still think that it's wise that uh, the county continue to be careful. We don't know what this news that the governor has put out is going to do. Uh, we want. I personally would like to have seen a lot more vaccinations uh, be given out. We're still less than 20% in the state of Texas that have received at least one uh, vaccination shot. I can continue to hope that everyone will get their vaccine. Um, and again, just continue to be smart. Let's not let this thing get out of hand. Right now it is on the, in, on the downturn, at least here locally in our region. I'd like to see it continue that way. We're still meeting twice a week on a conference call. Uh, and Terry from the hospital keeps us updated. Our COVID patient percentage in the hospitals in our region is now below 5%, which is great. We were up there above 25%, you know, two months ago. And we needed it below 15% for the governor to allow uh, additional openings. We got it past 15% and kept going down. And now the good news is it's below 5%. As of Friday, there were only six patients in the hospital. So that is good, but we don't want it to flare up again. Commissioner Parchman. No comment. Commissioner Fitch. Good. No and no. All right. Thank you all. Uh, we are not going to adjourn. We are going to recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow, at which time we will come back and visit, revisit item number nine and make some decisions as to what we're going to do about Justice Center repairs after we get some more information from the insurance company to help us know what they're going to pay for and not pay for. And again, we may need to meet several times over the next several weeks because there's a lot of uh, individual small detail decisions that need to be made to do that project right. So we will recess at this time at 1055 on Monday the 8th and pick back up at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 9th. All right, thank you for your attendance. All right, I, I like starting off with a prayer regardless. We're, we're reconvening from yesterday, but let's start it off right. If you'll join me and stand, please. Heavenly Father, we gather back again today to continue our discussion on damages to our 
uh, JP offices and all the uh, details that go along with that. And we pray that you will help us to uh, consolidate all these uh, needs together and accomplish the repairs and enhancements to that building according to your plan and do it in an efficient way that uh, conserves taxpayer dollars. We just turn this agenda over to you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's do a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> okay. James, your camera's on, right? All right, good morning. It is March the 9th. We meet today on a Tuesday uh, as a continuation, and we come out of uh, recess from yesterday's commissioner's court meeting, and we have one matter to talk about uh, because that's all that we can discuss today because we continued that meeting. We took care of all the other agenda items there yesterday with the exception of the discussion related to damages at our Justice of the Peace office. And so today we need to uh, approve, I believe, and give direction to Irma and to Steve and their staff. Um, and we'll probably be having some other meetings like this that are uh, in between normal meetings because we want to tread carefully as we uh, approve and authorize expenditures related to repairs and then when we get into conversations about additional work that we might want to do to that building that is not necessarily related to the damage but is merely taking advantage of an opportunity to do some work on that building while we've got personnel and equipment out of that building. So we're, this this will be a kind of an open discussion here. I've got I've kind of given you a working sheet there today. These are some these are the bare minimums that I would like for us to approve today, and uh, there are some exceptions given to us uh, in Section 262.024 that relate to. Uh, repairs, emergency repairs after a situation like this that require us not to go through the uh, bid process on all of these. I don't see any major items here as far as expense, certainly that's not covered by uh, our insurance. And I did speak with Brett yesterday, and uh, yeah, Brett would have liked to have seen us to pr proceed quicker. But as I thought more about that, and I didn't have all the right answers for Brett as to why we haven't already begun the remediation work over there, for one, you didn't have any place to go, uh, and two, um, you know, it's not just that simple. We couldn't just say, come on in and start tearing out those walls until we found location for you, found the ability to move the equipment and such. So. I do again think that the fact that you all removed that carpet quickly and got the water out of there is definitely going to be to our benefit. Nonetheless, we do want to proceed with these repairs and get the remediation company who is called Interstate rather than International Interstate. I don't know what the full name of that company is, but these are the bare minimum things I would like to do today. I would like to make it clear to everybody that we want to maintain careful details of any and all expenses related to that building, to your offices, any repairs, relocation, and any other expense item, no matter how small or large, related to the storm damage that could conceivably be covered by insurance. And we want to pile as much on there that we could possibly justify, and that's with Brett's instruction. And then also continuing that work, any non-storm related enhancements to that building. And there may be some overlap or some gray area in some of those, and we certainly again want to <clears throat> not improperly charge any expenses to an insurance claim, but we don't want to fail to put any expenses in there related to this claim if they are indeed uh, qualifying. Uh, the, so again, just establish a policy where why we are going to maintain careful record of all these expenses no matter what we do to that building and the uh, expenses that go along with it that may not be actual dollars put into that building. but 
moving your offices and all the expenses that go along with bringing you back there ultimately. I'd like to see us approve the relocation officially of, of your offices, JP1, down to the northwest corner of the first floor courthouse and the constable to the office adjacent to the treasurer and JP2 moving uh, and constable moving to the two conference rooms and the vacant office at adult probation. Have interstate begin remediation immediately or as soon as they possibly can. Hire movers and or moving equipment to relocate offices. Hire Cabro and Lantana to relocate network connections and telephone connections. Rent storage, whatever that looks like to accommodate office contents as needed, whether it's all on-site store, portable storage or whether you uh, rent storage from a local uh, storage facility. What have I left off of that list today, Steve, that we might want to approve there? Or Irma? I'm sorry? Nothing that I can think of at the moment we've already got numbers in the process of Sure, sure. Okay. Do you hear any squeaking? No. Okay. <laughs> that was my hearing aid. I apologize. For well, I, it takes sometimes there's other things that cause that too, anyway, low batteries. Uh, we've, uh, we've we started packing um, what we, we can get packed. Uh, and to move the storage facility, uh, we contacted Tim Dale. He's supposed to have some movers there today. They'll be moving stuff to a storage facility that he has on the site, as well as moving our offices, the things that we need from our office to our offices up here at the probation office. Good. That should start today as soon as uh, they get through making the move today. Uh, we will keep up with the expenses on that, uh, and that might be the expenses after the fact, you know, after we get it, you know. Uh, Cabro is in process now in my office, my new office, to get it all hooked up. Lantana Communications are on their way to get the phone system up and going, and then my understanding is that once they get through that, then they'll be going across the street to uh, Judge Dunn's facility and making that ready for them. Uh, we're looking at, well, we're going to need to find a facility that, or a storage pod approximately 40 foot long to house the benches Court, courtroom benches uh, and anything else that we might need to put in there uh, as well, Ray, uh, comfortable. Brand. Can I ask you about that? Why do we need to move those benches? Why out do of, we remove them? Yeah, why do we need to remove them? Uh, we remove them to remove the carpet. Well, I know. We we've got to move around and do move the carpet and get them away from the wall. Uh, now, they're very, they're very large, uh, and I don't think that. Uh, the Is moving them now absolutely necessary f to begin the remediation process? Granted, we're going to do some tile work eventually, and other work in there. Is it possible to just scoot those things around or, or rather than they're removing them? Heavy. Uh, they may be more expense for the mitigation crew to move those stuff, that stuff around. Uh, the guy, the, I'm understanding after talking with Mr. Kelly with uh, the, the project manager of this company, Interstate? Yeah. Interstate, that uh, somebody will be here riding to look and see what they're going to have to do. Uh, but that's, that's just a possibility of having to move that and the chairs and stuff somewhere. There's only a limited amount of space that. 
Mr. Dale has got available for our partnership and as far as larger storage facilities. Uh, we have to move them anyway, if, if we have to move them. But that's just something, that's something that we're looking at and seeing what we can get done. Uh, so that, that answers your question. Well, again, to I, I can't really picture those benches in in there that that's just going to take an awful lot of storage space and i don't want to jeopardize you being able to store the other things that you need if all those guys need to do is get in there and remove the perimeter sheetrock i was just wondering if we could scoot we, those things to the center and jam them up together we, we, we can leave them then when they come in they, you know. how many is it eight eight ten Benches? Yeah, 10, ten or twelve. Ten, ten or twelve, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Today we're, we're going to be in the process of removing the, uh, the jury box chairs. Uh, so they could bring those benches out to my shop out there. I got room. I can put them around and still and still make it usable for me if they get in somebody's way. Could you hold off and ask the guy coming Friday before they come? Hey. To save us some time and effort and storage expense. Yeah. <clears throat> but could you leave the benches there and let him tell us if they absolutely have to be moved or not? In other words, if we can prolong that or possibly. I don't know exactly how we we may be forced eventually to store them. Maybe we would only have to store some of them. Well, if, if, if we've got a place I got to room move, for them. So if somebody we needs to move them, they can move them. Store so. them if, when we find out from them whether or not they need to be moved out of the building. Uh, they're they're uh, we'll go from there. Okay. I, I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, how much other storage do you think you're going to need beyond those benches if we remove those from the conversation? At this point, I uh, really don't know. We, uh, from what I understand, our desks that are going to be remaining in the building itself, Tim is supposed to be moving those to the storage facility as well. And then whatever overflow after that, we may have to find, you know, we can look at something else, see if we can find another place to. Did he say what size he had available he, for you? I don't remember what size. Uh, what we showed him, he, he didn't have, didn't seem to have an issue with it, with what the amount of things we've got to get moved. Okay, so he's seen what you have over there to help you decide what size to get. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's Tim's Tim's movers. Okay. Okay. Uh, as far as keeping up expenses, uh, we're doing that at this time, and of course, everything that I get, I'm turning over to the accountant as well. And you might want to ask the accountants or the or the auditor's office. There's no need for you to keep a notebook in your you know, in your possession to write everything down. But if there's some specific coding on each and every PO uh, that you could do according to what the auditors tell you to help them keep up with it, maybe that's a good way to keep up with it. But I don't I don't expect you all to keep a notebook in your pocket to write everything down. But let them do that with the proper coding. And then, uh, you know, explain to them, hey, some of this is going to be for insurance claims. Some of it's going to be absolutely has nothing to do with an insurance claim. We're just. As of, as of right now, everything we're doing. I, I agree. But at some point, you're going to hit a point where you're going to, we're going to make a decision that say, hey, yeah, we, we want to do this, but it really doesn't, can't justifiably be charged to an insurance claim. Yeah, we're a long way from that. Um, what else can you think of that you'd like to see us give you approval for today? Uh, I can't think of anything. This will get you. This will get you. 
this will get you down the road, won't it? Okay. If you need any room for something, holler. Yeah. I can work around it. The doors for the office, if they were talking oh, yeah. about that. We need to get somebody to put those split doors. I'm thinking about get a door that they could split themselves and put a window in it, a regular house window that you can raise the window up and down. And then you don't have to have it open the door and then put a petition up there and take it down. You just leave the door shut and have a window in it. When do you think that we can have that done? Unless you want a half door. I mean, you could do it with a window and a door. Let me ask you this. Yeah, there's a little shelf on it. We can put a shelf on each side, just have a regular door. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I'm not a carpenter. We should, yeah, we need somebody with some carpenter skill. It's a big door. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this. I thought about this last night. What if we, the existing door that's there, would there be anything wrong with putting plexiglass, a shelf, and a pass-through, and that just staying there forever on that door? Just make a half, cut it in half. Make Not half. cut the door in half. Uh, just take, take the door, have them cut a window spot, have them put in a piece of plexiglass with a, with a space at the bottom, and then a, you know, 15, that 18 inch. glass in already, did it? Yes. yes. Might, yeah. We might can take that glass out and store it and put plexiglass with a pass-through through it and mount a little shelf or something for now. Yes. Might do that. If that door will come apart. You got a big piece of that. Mm -hmm. our, our glass, if the glass is that. Yeah. That's on there right now? Yeah. yeah. Whether that be big enough or. Probably not. Wait, but if you took that and, and, and expanded it and, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, cut you out a bigger window that would stay there with that door with a pass through so that whatever we use that office for, it's not going to hurt to have a window in it, I don't think. And if it was a problem, we could always go back and do a nice job of sealing off that hole with a piece of metal that was screwed in there. I mean, trying to find doors, these yeah. doors are so old, trying to find a door that exactly fits that and exactly matches up on the... Window, just a standard window pretty close to that opening. But I bet you we could get one of the glass companies to come over there say, hey, Easy. we need a quick job here. Would that would that work for that you? Would work. That, it, it, it would be better than is there anything that, that, I, that is there anything that a half door would do for you that doing it this way wouldn't do for you? No. Okay. Probably more secure. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as getting that done. I know Brown's Glass, they did a good job at that boating center on all their windows and things. I mean, he did some neat stuff. Uh, Gary, he'll know what to do. Who? Gary Brown. Brown's Glass. Brown's Glass. Brown. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. I'll take that on. So I need your door and both doors that way? Yes. Okay. What is what does the door look like there? And how many of your doors? You've got three different places you're going. How many doors need that? Just the one. Just that one. Just the conference room there on the immediate right. Is there a door? Is there a window on that door yeah, right now? It's about twenty by thirty window. Glass. It's frosted glass. About twenty by thirty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we might we might could, it we might. Could. It's a two inch solid core door. It's a house of a door. Just take that one out probably mm -hmm. and and uh, put the plexiglass up there like we're doing this one down here with the gap at the bottom. In, other, in bottom. other words, use the same space that's there, replace the frosted glass with a shorter piece of plexiglass mm -hmm. so that there's a pass through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That solve you. And then when yeah, we're done, works. we just put the frosted glass right back in there. Okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can't get James working on that. James is in here. Hey James! Will you, will you, will you, will you, call, will you call Browns and see if they might could help us with an emergency job and come take a look at it? 
today. Why don't you go ahead and give them a call, see if we can't maybe get ahead of their schedule for the day. Um, okay, what else? That little red storage building is sitting there beside the building. We can put a lot of stuff in it. I had never moved it yet. I got the keys in my truck. The one on the south end. So 14 by 16 or something. That'd be good storage. Remember, it's, it's, it's hot and humid and dirty, so don't put, you know, it's hot, humid, and dirty. Don't put, you know, nice, don't put nice official form forms and stuff like that. Okay, anything else? Not at this time. Uh, I, that doesn't make something I come up here in the next five minutes. Uh, no. <laughs> yes, if it does, uh, I think we can justify meeting quicker than 72 hours if emergency items come up here. So anything else we discuss here, let's go, here, here would be my suggested motion and you can kind of use this as your framework for this. This is my suggestion that we approve the following related to the Justice Center, comma, Justices of the Peace and Constables. And that list would include basically what we're saying here. Maintain, I think you could probably word it just like you've got it here, and then add to that modified door glass on two doors. So again, uh, commissioners approved the following related to the Justice Center and the offices of the Justices of the Peace and the Constables list those items there. That'd be my suggestion. But it will need a motion. If you all want to do it another way, how about that it? That kind of covers everything. Make that motion. Motion is made by Commissioner Fitch. Second. Second Commissioner Parker. Any further discussion, comments, modifications to that? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any other uh, decisions that we need to make today as far as the uh, work that Glenn Calvert talked to us about yesterday? How do you want to proceed with any of those ideas? Do you want to hold off? Do you want to begin that? process because we are talking about um, I, I guess we need to find out from your remediation guy on Friday very carefully from him where does your work stop Are you just going to come in and cut out the sheetrock throw it away and throw away the bad insulation and say see you we're gone or are you going to replace the sheetrock and insulation and whatever else gets torn up in that process uh, I, I will, I'll ask you that, but if, you know, if they're going to replace just half the insulation that's, that's damaged and there's not any insulation up above or that something's got to come back and paint I, I'll ask them what it's about, you know, which do we, regardless of any other remodeling, if they allow us to go in and just repair it
Glenn, Glenn, look at it too. See what that insulation factor was on that wall. And then, you know, if it's, if it's we have to hire a contractor, we hire a contractor, you know, this is what they pulled out. This is what it's going to cost. Uh, the contractor, this is what it's going to cost. Put this back and just buy that, you know, separate from anything else. Just on well, you're saying give give us like two bids or different bids for what we're well, gonna. I, I, if 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 it has to be bid, then I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's back up a second. I think that anything else that we do, it, it makes sense to me to encompass the repair of the sheetrock and replacement of the insulation into a job under one umbrella that includes any other improvements, enhancements to that building. And I think that we can be helped in that process by a project manager, engineer, architect, whatever that person looks like. But I don't think that we can just give the nod to Glenn without at least asking for, uh, you know, some kind of request for qualifications, you know, because that, that person would very possibly be paid in excess of 50,000. Um, and so therefore you've got to be careful who you, uh, choose. Now we have had another, uh, contractor who is a certified construction manager, that being uh, Carl Smith. You have two entities here with, with Preford and Glenn Calvert and, and Carl Smith that I don't know that you would bid that process, but I think you have to go through a request for proposal, request for qualifications. And I don't know exactly what role either one of those are going to play at this point. You know, I think Carl Moore uh, is in the construction business, and so uh, I, I kind of want just—I kind of want just a, an advisor at this point. Well, that deal that that Glenn gave you yesterday, that stated that that we had to have an engineer according to the law is yeah. that i mean did you check into that is that any thing that we've got to got to be careful i think absolutely there? you do where we're the kind of money that we are spending uh and whether or not we're going to get into architectural needs to have an architect glenn didn't seem to think that we would but we will certainly need an engineer to help us with the hvac uh, decisions that will be made there. Um, I think what I would like to do, I believe that we could probably, I don't know, maybe you should authorize me to be able to talk to Glenn about, you know, we would like to utilize your services, but before we can do that, uh, we need to have a better understanding of, of what that fee might be for your helping us coordinate that and, uh, and putting together a bid package. I'm thinking we can get those fees done for well under $50,000 and the bulk of your expenses are going to come in the form of hiring the, the contractors or the general contractor to oversee that job. So I think it would be okay if you wanted to authorize me to discuss um, the role that preferred complex designs and the services of Glenn Calvert to help us get this job initiated. But at some point there will have to be people that can bid once a, once a bid package is put together. So again, not knowing what the fee to Preford might be, I'll explain to Glenn that you know we've got to be real careful. We can't go over fifty thousand dollars on on an award to any one entity related to this job. So back to the, the interstate guys spoke on the year of Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll verify again today or tomorrow on the 
the day that he's going to be here. Uh, he or she. What, you know, just move this out, you know, and, you know, cut out what they have to find out what they have to move around. Far down. So they do the job. You might also ask him, do we, before you even get here, should we get somebody over here to knock holes in that bottom 24 inches to at least get the air flowing? Or at this point, is that, is that moot? The guy is supposed to, my mind, what I understand, discussed it with him, it was on a period of, yeah, period of project management. So send somebody down here to assess what they're going to have and how to get started. Okay. Uh, but if he, well, if he tells you we can't, we'll be here in two weeks, I'd like to know from him, you know, we can get somebody over there with a sledgehammer and start knocking out some of that sheetrock right now if it's critical that we start the airflow in those spaces. See what he says to that. I, we can, we can uh, pursue that again. You want to understand from Brett and the inspector, the adjuster, and interstate. This is all going to be done by somebody that's licensed to the state to start removing environmental issues. So, because of the Okay. So, if you've got somebody here local that's just let him make that decision for us. Just say, we understand from Brett that we would have liked, he would have liked to have seen the remediation process have begun sooner, but it didn't because of these reasons. We didn't have any place to go, et cetera, et cetera. If you all are, I mean, he's not coming until Friday, so we know his crew's not coming until at least next week, if not the week or two after that. Find out from him, is there anything that we can do immediately that will help the project, such as removing or knocking a hole in that bottom two feet of the sheetrock to allow the drying to begin faster? That's my only question for him. I don't think there's anything else we want to do, but. You know, if he says, yeah, getting a sledgehammer and knocking a six by six hole in each stud would help, well, then we could do that. He may say, no, it doesn't really matter. And hopefully that's what he'll say. And, and the thought would be also that if they can't get here within two weeks or, you know, a reasonable amount of time with the crew, then we've done everything that we can do at this point to get something done and then you know it's not going to be responsible for the county for anything that's interesting. Right. Well hopefully he hopefully he's gonna say, hey good news, we're gonna be here next week. Okay, so what do you think about the, the second and final motion would be to authorize me to continue discussions with Glenn Calvert on next steps to initiate a comprehensive repair and enhancement to the Justice Center. Maintaining compliance with any bidding requirements. Sounds good. Get that? Did you get all that? I've got all right here to discuss the critical complex design that starts with the bin column. Um, next step to initiate repair at Joseph's Center. Repair, repairs, and enhancements to the Justice Center. Okay, uh, I'll make that motion. We've got a motion by Jimmy. Second. Second by John Fitch. Any 
more conversation on it. I, I need y'all's help to keep make sure we do this so right. So whatever they need to do to the doors for for Browns, just do Did it. Did he give you any? We may have to swap the doors like down do. here. I Discussion or suggestions or questions about how we're moving forward here. Can I get the motion? Who made the motion? The motion was made Jimmy. by Jimmy and seconded by Fitch. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Can you think of anything else that we need to do at this meeting right now? Not at this time. And as you reach decision points here in the next few days, if you do, that needs approval, let's talk about that. If I need to throw together an emergency meeting, I will. Okay. I don't know of anything else. If you all do, let's talk about it. If not, let's uh, adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Parker. All in favor say aye. Aye. aye.